Today's video was recorded on March 21st, 2023. Today's lesson continues on in our series on God's appointed feasts, and these are the biblical holidays that you can find in Leviticus 23. So this week's topic is the Day of Atonement, and more specifically, how can we understand that Jesus is the atoning sacrifice and the scapegoat who carries away our sin? Now, I pray that you're seeing how important these holidays are to understanding God's plan of redemption for the whole world. And then, even more importantly, how Jesus is pointedly fulfilling these holidays as the Redeemer. And I think you can see how important it is for Christians to understand the underlying concepts that are being communicated through the holidays. And these underlying concepts within these holidays, well, they still apply to us today, and it's still important for us to integrate them into our faith walk. They never stopped being important. It's just that they took on a new significance in the ministry, the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. And as you'll see today with the Day of Atonement, this isn't a holiday for those outside the faith. This is a holiday for those who are already in relationship with God. And as Christians, we're in a covenant relationship with God through the new covenant, a new covenant that was ratified with the blood of Jesus. And since, you know, we're not magically perfect when we profess our faith in God, unfortunately, those who profess Jesus as Lord can still sin, even as believers. And then when we sin, well, we have to have a mechanism that reconciles us back to God. This is the Day of Atonement. And thankfully, we have an eternal sacrifice, Jesus, that at any moment we find ourselves off the path, we can turn back to God in repentance and be reconciled back to him through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. And this, folks, this is truly good news. So we hope you enjoy this lesson on the Day of Atonement and how Jesus is our atoning sacrifice and the scapegoat who carries away our sins on our behalf. Just a comment as we start, there's so much to each of these holidays. So if this is the first time you're hearing them, you could do this every year for the next 20 years and still discover something new and something profound. The more that you understand the holidays or even integrate them into your lives, the more God reveals things to you, how profound these holidays are. So hopefully, Tonight, I think you'll see, boy, Day of Atonement, there's some profound things happening then. And I still think, especially a holiday like this, how important it is for a group, any group, whether it's a church, a nation, any organization, there's always that tendency for sin to creep in. And then the people in the organization don't even notice it. And this has happened throughout history, even if you believe in Jesus. The church has had to repent from certain things, and perhaps there are things today that we still have to repent from, or at least in certain areas of the church. So it's, a, it's an amazing holiday to say, let's stop, reflect on our year, and let's confess our sin and forgive each other so that we don't keep repeating this stuff. You know, it's a, it's a great holiday. Even if, even if you don't have the sacrifices, the the concept is still there and, and profound. All right, so our holiday tonight, then, is Day of Atonement. And, of course, we're going to look at how does the Bible explain to us that Jesus is the scapegoat? And there's actually something very strange. So John makes a comment. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, the takes away... That's scapegoat language. But then he calls Jesus a lamb. And so what it's like, if Jesus is the lamb, the Passover lamb, but he's also the scapegoat. So he's everything is being fulfilled in him. And so John the Baptist, John, that John, John the Baptist says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin. So he's combining the Passover lamb with the, the scapegoat and the function of the scapegoat. That had never been done before. Nobody, nobody within any Jewish writings 
combined those two, said that there was a lamb who took away sins. But of course, Jesus, he's everything. He's the fulfillment of all of this. So we'll see tonight how he is the scapegoat. The painting there in the background, very cool. William Holman Hunt. And this was painted in 1854. And he was on a pilgrimage of sorts because he was having a crisis of faith and he went to Israel. And then he was down by the Dead Sea and he paints this picture of the scapegoat. Now, I want you to notice something about this, this painting because it's very accurate, not necessarily to the Bible, well, although it is accurate to the Bible, but also to the custom. And the custom was that when the priest selects the goat, that's going to be the scapegoat, the way you identify it, because you don't want to mix the goats up, the way you identify it is you put a scarlet thread on the goat's head. And you can see there, he even painted the scarlet thread. So when we get to the end, or we'll talk throughout about the scarlet thread, and then you'll get to the end and see the significance of what happens with that scarlet thread. But even in 1854, he's in Israel, so he's listening to the context of the holiday, not just what do the biblical words say, because there's no mention of scarlet thread in the Bible, but it becomes a custom that, as you'll see at the very end, there's significance to the custom. So, okay. So, this is our ninth in the series, God's Appointed Feasts. And I've mentioned this a couple times, but I'll say it tonight. Uh, next week, that will be part 10. We'll move to the Feast of Tabernacles. And then from the Feast of Tabernacles, there's a launching point that we're going to go into the birthday of Jesus, because many scholars put the birthday of Jesus at the Feast of Tabernacle. Now, we don't know exactly the, the date because the Bible doesn't tell us, but I can show you how through Luke you can discover that. And then the symbolism of the Festival of Tabernacles makes sense if you're going to bring the light of the world in, bring them in during the festival that celebrates light. And we talked last week, Jesus is beginning his holiday. It seems he's beginning his holiday right around these, the, the fall festivals. 40 days of fasting, that's around the fall festivals. There's the baptism of repentance. And if he's turning 30 during that festival, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, it's 30 years old when you become a rabbi, a full rabbi. That's when your culture would recognize you as rabbi. So Jesus, and Luke tells us, Jesus was 30 years old when he started his ministry. So we'll do Feast of Tabernacles, we'll do Jesus' birthday, and then we're going to talk about Hanukkah. And although there's no commandment that says celebrate Hanukkah, Jesus does celebrate Hanukkah. So we should at least pay attention to the holiday. And then with Hanukkah, the events that give birth to that festival, they're so important to understanding the recent history of first century Jews in Israel and how they're responding to Rome and how they respond to Jesus, who they think is their king. And they want him to overthrow Rome, just like not only their heroes from the, the Hanukkah event, the Maccabees, but the Pharaoh or Moses and the Pharaoh. So that's what we'll do, and then, and then we'll move on from, from that point. Quick review, quick review of the holidays. So we've kind of done, done this ad nauseum, but I want to show you not only where we are within the holiday structure, the seventh month and the tenth day, but also how it fits into the Exodus narrative. So, so uh, we've, we've said over and over the the holidays are a picture of redemption, right? That's defined as the presence of God is dwelling back with his people, the people of God in the place of God or the presence of God. Now, that's how Revelation ends. The presence of God, the people of God, the place of God. That's how the, the Bible begins. That's how the Bible ends. That's redemption. But if you want the narrative of that picture of redemption, you read the book of Exodus. And Exodus follows that plan of redemption. All the holidays we'll see in the book of Exodus. So, 
How do, how do we start out? Well, you have the Passover event. That's the great deliverance from Egypt, of course. 14th day of the first month, very next day, unleavened bread, 15th day, then first fruits. So Jesus is the Passover lamb. He's the unleavened bread. He's the first fruits of the resurrection. He ascends, or I'm sorry, he walks around for 40 days, and then he ascends. And you, from first fruits, we have a 49 day period counting down as we get closer to entering into that covenant with God. And that covenant is represented on the Feast of Weeks, uh, the festival that God says count seven weeks, or on the 50th day. That's where we get Pentecost. Then we go to the seventh month, and that's what we've been on for the past few weeks. There's going to be a trumpet blast one day. It's the call to repentance. We all have to come back and we have to stand before the king. And we're going to stand before the king because sin must be judged. And then God ultimately, in the final analysis, forgives our sin. That's atonement. And then we have a big celebration, the eight-day festival, Feast of Tabernacles, either here on earth, but we're preparing for that celebration in heaven. And those are all in the seventh month. So, okay. Again, if we go to the book of Exodus, we say, well, how's the book of Exodus begin? Well, it begins in slavery, right? So we're, we're all enslaved to something. And the, the, we have to defeat the Pharaoh, whether it's the, the, the evil that exists in the world, or it's our own personal habits that we just can't quite get rid of. So we start in slavery. We're delivered. We're delivered by the blood of a lamb. God brings us and says, I want to be in a covenant relationship with you. God's not a despotic leader. He's not a totalitarian dictator like Pharaoh was. He wants to be in relationship like a husband and wife. And there are rules you got to follow when you're in relationship. Now, the Israelites, they're delivered out. They go to Mount Sinai and they say to God, yes, we will obey. We'll do everything you say, God. And what's the first thing they do? They build a golden calf. So they immediately sin. So right after that, they sin. Now we go into this period uh, where Moses is up on the mountain, 40 days and 40 nights. And God's going to disclose his attributes to Moses. God's going to say, look, I'm a God who forgives you. Moses says, okay, well, you're going to have to forgive us now because we're not going to go to the promised land without you. And what happens is they come back into relationship. That would be right around the Day of Atonement. So the Day of Atonement is a seen as a time of year when you reconcile yourself to God. And of course, the book of Exodus ends with a tabernacle. As they finally build that tabernacle and the presence of God dwells intensely with his people because he's forgiven them. And one thing we have to notice, and I know I keep harping on this, Christians get very confused about these holidays. The Day of Atonement is for the believers. It's for those who already believe in God, who are in relationship with God. It's for us. When we go astray and have to come back and say, God, I, you know, my path went, I went off the path. I didn't intend to. Will you forgive me? And God says, yes, I want to be in relationship with you. So, and we have a goat that'll carry away the sins, uh, our sins. It's an eternal sacrifice. So, okay, very important that we see that it matches Exodus. And that day of atonement is going to be the day where you come back into relationship. God's going to, uh, and we'll see in a very dramatic way, remove your sins. Okay? So, number one on your handout, that was all just review as we've talked for the past few weeks, Day of Atonement. So, what I'd like you to do is turn in the book of Leviticus, because let's at least read the two verses uh, that talk about the Day of Atonement. I'll have you go to Leviticus 23. And then just know that the next thing we're going to read is Leviticus 16. So you'll stay in Leviticus for a moment. So the Leviticus 23 is where we find all the holidays. And after the Feast of Trumpets, which is the call to repentance, the whole world is going to come before God to be judged. And then we're going to have a ceremony for atonement. So verse 26, 
Well, verse 26 is short. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, verse 27, However, on the tenth day of this seventh month is a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation to you, and you shall afflict yourself, and you'll sh- you, shall offer, you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. Now, the afflict yourself has traditionally, uh, by our Jewish brothers and sisters, been translated as fast. So there's fasting on the Day of Atonement. Okay, verse 8. You shall do no manner of work on that day, for this is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. So here's the day as we come back to God to say, God, forgive our sins so that we can come back into relationship. And as we talked last year, it's a time of renewal. It's a new year. You're going to resolve that, God, I repent of my actions last year. I resolve to do better as we go forth into the new year. Um, Okay, so just a couple things about Day of Atonement. Let's look at the word in Hebrew. So the first thing is, and I don't have my handout right in front of me, but I put all this on, on your handout. So Day of Atonement in Hebrew, Yom which means day, so yom is day, ha, now this is how it's written in the Bible, ha is the, and then kippurim, so the Bible, kippurim, we call it yom kippur, or yom kippur, that's singular, like that's the day, but in the Bible it says it's a day of atonement, but plural, atonements, kippurim, so it's the day of atonements, and that sounds a little bit strange, because you would say, well, isn't it singular, but who's being atoned for? Well, it's a, a group that's plural. It's the nation. So it's not only you as the individual. We're so individualistic in the West. We don't think nation. Israel was so non-individualistic that they thought nation. So uh, it's the day of atonement. And Hebrew is a very interesting and very descriptive language, so much more than English. And I know I've mentioned a a couple times, English has something like 175,000 words. It's a lot. Our language has a lot of words, partly because we're a melting pot. But biblical Hebrew, the Bible, biblical Hebrew only has 6,000 words. And so what, what happens is you can have one Hebrew word and like 10 different English words that express some aspect of that Hebrew word. So. And sometimes a Hebrew word can explain an entire concept. And so that's what we're going to do is talk about what's this concept of atonement, right? But one of my favorite ones, for instance, in Hebrew, the word for face, panim, the face is plural. And you think, well, wait a minute. I only have one face, don't I? And they would say, ah, no, you don't. You have many faces, right? Now you have the physical part that's on your skull, but you have many faces. You have a happy face. You have a sad face. You have an angry face. You have a confused face. So Hebrew is is very descriptive, even in these little things like something that's plural expresses something about a face or about atonement. So how many sins are being atoned for? Well, many. So one of the things we have to do here is we have to think about the entire concept of atonement. Right? What do you mean when someone says day of atonement? What do you mean by atonement? Right? Well, sometimes we use religious words so often we lose the underlying sense. And you have to stop to say, wait, what do you mean by that? Let's make sure we're on the same page. So on your sheet, I'm going to go down uh, in number one. We start all Hebrew. If you want to know the root of a Hebrew, even a noun, you go back to the verb. All Hebrew words are based off of a verb. And so this verb is kapar. Now, what happens when you speak Hebrew or you write it out, as the the word changes slightly from verb to noun, the vowels are what changes. So kapar, what does kapar mean? Well, it means to make atonement. And that's really not helpful, right? If we're trying to define the word atonement by using the word atonement, it gets too circular. But what does, what does it mean by atonement? Well, one is make atonement. That's our word that we use. 
Another one is it's reconciliation. And that's what atonement is. We're coming back into the relationship. Well, how are we going to get back into that relationship? So another aspect of kapar is a ransom. And so a ransom, well, that's a substitute. So if you demand a ransom, right, if you're demanding money as a substitute for somebody's life, that would be a ransom for somebody's life. So in a sense, we're, we're being reconciled back to God. That's the, the make reconciliation through a ransom, through a substitution. The blood or the life of an innocent animal is substituted for our blood, our life. So the idea of to make atonement is it's all wrapped up in this, con in this uh, concept of coming back into relationship with God, but it has to be through a type of substitution. Now, I think we can all recognize that in Jesus' death as substitution for ours. So uh, in the New Testament, you often see a word uh, propitiation and instead of atonement. But it's the same concept. Uh, propitiation is about favor or forgiveness or grace. How do we get back into God's favor if, after we have sin in our life? Right? You have to move through that process where something is ransomed, something is sacrificed, the blood of something else is the substitute for our blood. And of course, Jesus is the eternal sacrifice. Um, okay. So that's the verb. That's kind of what it means. Now, if we go to some nouns, because every all nouns are based on a verb, um, you have the verb koper, and that just means a ransom. The ransom is a gift to secure favor. It's a substitute. We want to be reconciled back to God, and we need a substitute on our behalf that will bring us back into that God. Now. It's very important because we see this throughout the Bible, especially the prophets and definitely Jesus. The ransom is a substitute, but the main idea is that this whole process is not mechanical. God is not like, uh, is not like something where you push a button and you get an automatic response on the other side. It's not mechanical. And the sacrifices are not supposed to become mechanical. They're not supposed to be like a winning formula. If you're outside of favor with God, well, I just do this and God lets me back in. The main point of the sacrifice is to affect your heart. It's to remind you about the penalty for sin. It's to remind you that it's your life that should be dying, but God is going to accept the substitute to be reconciled back to his creation. So that's when the prophets say, God doesn't want sacrifices and offerings. I do not desire. I want a heart that, that moves towards me. And so you can make a sacrifice and have, have zero movement in your heart. God doesn't want that. So it's not mechanical. It's a heart condition. When people's heart gets hard, then they no longer have the sense of what the, what the, the uh, substitute is for. Okay, and that's, of course, what Jesus and the, and the prophets rail against. Now, this whole idea is really the basis for, in the Old Testament, a, a theology of reconciliation. How do we come back into relationship with God? Not the, not the outside, we're pagan sinners. The We're inside, we're in relationship with God, and we've failed, and we've sinned. God, how do I come back into relationship with you? That's the ransom. Okay, then you get the noun kippur, and this is the one that we're most familiar with. Uh, it gets, as a noun, it gets uh, translated atonement. It also is the mercy seat. So sometimes in your Bible, mercy seat is the, is the kippur. It's the place where you sprinkle the blood that is going to offer, that's the ransom. So it's not only, uh, it's not only the what happens in your relationship with God, but it's also the place where the blood is sprinkled. And it's all about forgiveness, re reconciliation, 
and favor. So that's the concept, right? And I think what's more important, and the reason I gave you, and word studies are not always easy, but the reason I gave you all those words, it's real important for us to understand what this ceremony does, what it represents, coming back into relationship with God, being reconciled to God after he forgives us. All right, hopefully you'll be able to see that. I know, like I said, word studies will often make your, just makes your brain shut off because it's too difficult, but I want to at least show you the concept of reconciliation. Okay, now let's talk about this ceremony that they're going to have, the scapegoat ceremony. And to do that, turn to Leviticus 16. So a couple chapters back from Leviticus uh, 23. Because Leviticus 16, the entire chapter is about the scapegoat ceremony. And we're not going to read, we're only going to read a couple verses, only verse 7 to 10, because I just want to show you where it is in the text that they talk about this idea of casting lots and multiple goats, and one of them is going to be the scapegoat. Okay, so it's a complex ceremony. Aaron has to offer a sacrifice for his own sin, for the sins of the priests. Then he's going to then we're going to do this scapegoat cer- or the the goat ceremony and this is going to be for the nation. So verse 7, he shall take two goats and set them before the Lord at the door of the tent of meeting. Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats. So it's going to be a random selection. One lot for the Lord and the other lot For the scapegoat. And we'll talk about this word here in a minute. It's Azazel. Now that gets translated scapegoat. That's how we interpret that. But it's really a word has a little bit different meaning. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But right there you can see one one lot is going to be the sacrifice for sin that goes to the God. The other one is the scapegoat. That's the one that's going to carry the sins away from the city. Okay, verse 9. Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and offer him for a sin offering. So that one's the sin offering. But verse 10, but the goat on which the lot fell for the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement for him, to send him away for the scapegoat into the wilderness. That's not an easy sentence to uh, translate. The scapegoat gets sent off into the wilderness. Now, we, you see later in Leviticus, the priest takes the sins of the nation and places them on the head of the goat. And so in a very concrete ritual, the goat is going to leave with your sins on his head. And that's at least the, the symbolism here. Okay, that's where we find it. Now, what's it look like? Well, you have a high priest, right? And he selects two goats. They, uh, they should be similar, right? One goat, two goats. He's going to cast lots so that we're just randomly selecting one. One's going to be the atonement for sin. It's the sin offering. That goat will ultimately go to God. That's the one where they sprinkle the blood inside the Holy of Holies. The second one becomes the scapegoat to carry the sins away. That's the symbolism of removing sin from the community. And as I mentioned, because we looked at that picture that I have in the background is that the priest, in order to mark that scapegoat, would put a scarlet thread on his head. That's to identify, because you don't want to inadvertently place the sins on the wrong goat. You don't want to get the whole thing mixed up. So the priest uses a scarlet thread. Now, real quick, what's going to happen? Well, the priest is going to take that scapegoat eventually with all the sins of the nation, and it's going to go out. They take it out to the east to a cliff. And then with the sins of the nation on top of that scapegoat's head, he pushes them off the cliff. Now, I don't know. That's not in the Bible. It kills the, the goat. Perhaps one day they took it out, you know, and the goat comes wandering back in. I don't know, brought the sins of the community back in. But it's all ritual to show you the sins are out there in the, in the desolate place where sin belongs, but not here in our city. Okay? Now, that's the ceremony. 
uh, selecting the goat, placing the sin of the people on its head, taking it outside to a cliff and pushing it off the cliff. Okay, number three on your handout. The Bible uses the term azazel. It's a difficult word to translate. They're not exactly sure what the root of the word is. And this word azazel only shows up in the Bible in Leviticus 16. So it's really tough for translators to get a good sense of what this is. We translate it scapegoat because that's how we understand it. And we know the ceremony of what's going on. But the word azazel itself, well, so here's what it, scholars, as, they, as they're kind of circling this word, they would say something that departs, something that's banished, or to banish something, uh, to remove. So the goat that departs, the goat that removes. Uh, another one, to take away, the goat that takes away, because what's the goat doing? He's taking away the sin. And so it has something to do. Uh, another one I found, remove entirely. So we're not really sure. It's the goat that is for Azazel. It's the goat for removing. And that gets translated as the scapegoat. But I want, I want you to pay attention to that word, because when we get later to something in John, you're going to go, aha, I know what the crowd is chanting at Jesus at this moment. So that's the word Azazel. It's just the idea of removing, taking away, departing banishing. Okay? All right. Number four, I'm kind of, I'm going to, I'll bring all these together in a minute. We talked about this a little bit last week, and it's important to recognize the symbolism of this uh, ceremony is so important to the people. Um, in the ancient Near East, or in the ancient world, their conception of sin was that sin had thingness. That when you sin, something was actually created in the cosmos that was like a thing. Very concrete. They don't think as abstractly as we do. But the thingness can be felt, right? So if you sin, then you feel the weight of that sin as if there was something actually there. And when, you've, when you confess your sin or you apologize and seek forgiveness from the person you offended, and they say, oh, I forgive you. It feels like a weight has been lifted. So it feels like it, even the word forgive in Hebrew means to lift. So their, their idea is that there's something there. Now, the other thing they, they recognize is that God, even though we can't see the sin, God can. That God's eyes can see the sin. And so part of the, part of the ritual is we have to remove the sin from God's eyes. Remove it all the way out to the desolate places where sin belongs. So the ceremony serves as a concrete ritual to show them, because we would just say, God forgives you. It's like, no, that's not good enough to an ancient Near Easterner. They want concreteness. Oh, okay, here, place the sins on a goat, send them over there. Okay, got it. Now I understand. So it helps the community understand that God removed their sin. Okay. I want to show you two examples. So if you, the first one, turn to Psalm 103. These are two examples of ancient Near East thinking about how God removes sin. That it's very tangible to them, and we're more abstract. God forgives you. Like, okay, what happens with that sin? Where does it go, right? So Psalm 103 is, is a great one, starting in verse 8. because. Verse 8 reflects Exodus 34, the point in Exodus when God is going to disclose his attributes to Moses is right here. It's repeated in verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness. That's right out of the book of Exodus. So you can see, and that's the moment of, of atonement that where, the, where the reconciliation comes back, the Israelites and God. So we've got a reflection of Exodus 34. God's merciful. He's slow to anger. He's abundant in loving kindness. That's faithfulness. Covenant faithfulness is loving kindness. Verse 9, he will not always accuse, neither will he stay angry forever. Verse 10, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, 
nor repaid us for iniquities. That's the idea that, hey, we deserve our punishment. And God says, I'm going to withhold it. Verse 11, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. And then here's the main verse. How far away is God going to remove your sin? As far as the east is from the west, so he has removed our transgressions from us. That's a scapegoat ceremony. And how far is it from east to west? Well, it's as far away as possible to, a, to an Easterner. And notice, God's actually removing something. That's how they envision it. He's picking it up. That's forgiveness. I lifted it off of you. I'm picking it up and I'm taking it away to where we can no longer see it and it doesn't affect you. And that, of course, I think all of us can identify with that in some way, shape, or form. Thank you, God, for removing our sins. So it's a perfect example of this. Now I'll show you one more. This is in Micah, Micah 7, 8. I'm going to do this one a little faster. I'm watching the time. If you get a chance, you can, I know you'll recognize this verse. Uh, Micah 7, verse 18 and 19. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the disobedience of the remnant of his heritage? What kind of God is it that would forgive our iniquities? He doesn't retain his anger forever because he delights in loving kindness. Again, covenant faithfulness. And then verse 19, he will again have compassion uh, uh, on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. And, oh, by the way, where is God going to send our sin? He's going to cast their sin into the depths of the sea. The bottom of the abyss, the place of judgment. So I just wanted to show you how important this uh, ceremony is to the Eastern mind. Even like I mentioned when we talked last week, that there was a scapegoat ceremony similar to the one in Israel in Babylon. They're dealing with the same thing. How do we remove our sin that has crept up over the past year? So, okay, two good examples of the concreteness of Eastern thinking. Now, flip your page over, because now we get to the good, the meaty stuff. Jesus as the scapegoat. And I think all of us recognize, at this point, Jesus is the scapegoat, the eternal scapegoat who carries away the sins of the world. But what, what I want to show tonight, where do we find that in the Gospels? Where do we see a scapegoat ceremony? Okay? And oddly enough, it's found in the narrative part of Jesus and Barabbas. Okay? So turn in your Bible to Matthew 27. 15 to 18. So it's obviously obvious Jesus has been arrested. He's with Pilate. And now all of a sudden we get this character Barabbas that shows up. And let me just, I'll read verse 15 here. So it says, now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release to the crowd a prisoner of their choosing. Verse 16, at that time, they were holding a notorious prisoner named Barabbas. So when the crowd had assembled, Pilate asked them, which one do you want to release, or which one do you want me to release to you? Now, notice the, the way, this is really important to notice, the way that he makes the, comp the comparison, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ. Now, why does Pilate have to add the part, who is called the Christ? Why does he say, Barabbas? Why doesn't he just say, why not Barabbas or Jesus? Why does he say Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Christ? Okay, that's a good question here. Now, let me just show you the NIV, same verses. So, you may have the NIV. If you have the New King James, I know there's a footnote. But listen to the NIV or watch what the NIV did when they made their change. Okay? Now, it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. And so, 
what this footnote in the NIV tells us, and I think also the New King James has a footnote, is early manuscripts had the name Jesus Barabbas. And what seems to have happened is that as time went by and scribes were copying our Bibles, somebody said, uh, I don't like that this criminal's name is Jesus. Take that out. And so you started to see the manuscripts with that eliminated, with only Barabbas. So the earlier the manuscripts you see, the more likely that's what was in the original. So it seems we have a person whose name is, is Jesus, and, well, we would say his last name, Barabbas, but we'll talk about what that means. But this is in the NIV, and they point that out. They made that change in 2011. So, verse 17, So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you? And now it makes more sense. Do you want Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? Now the comparison makes more sense. Ah, because I have two people named Jesus, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to designate which one is which, the Messiah or Barabbas, okay? So that's really important for us to notice in the text, that, that is, uh, they have the same first name. So watch this. What does the word Barabbas mean? Okay, because it's not his last name. We turn everybody's, how they identify people into their last name. The word bar is Aramaic for son. And what's Abba? Father. So one person is called Jesus, the son of the father. Now this is really interesting. So you have Jesus, the son of the father, and Jesus whom we call the Christ. The Messiah. Right? So if we go back to this, there's Jesus Barabbas. Jesus, who, now you can really see that comparison, right? The Son of the Father. Jesus, Son of the Father. Jesus, the Christ. Which one, which Jesus is going to be able to carry away your sins? And now we've got to make a choice. Who are we selecting? And by the way, just don't, don't forget, Jesus' name means God will save or God's salvation. Yah, meaning Yah, God, Yah, God's salvation. Yah will save. So it's this really cool comparison, right? And what happens to Barabbas? He's set free while Jesus goes on to become the scapegoat. So they make the Christ, the one who is called the, the Christ, the scapegoat. Which Jesus can carry your sins away? Ah, the Christ can. Not just any old person named Jesus. And that's the comparison that scholars have noted this. What's going on with this in, in the text? And you have to know something about Barabbas, his name, and we have to know something about that scapegoat ceremony. Now, there's an interesting thing happening in the book of John. And Again, watching the time, I'm just going to put it up on the screen. In the book of John, at that ceremony with Pilate, the crowd begins to shout. Pilate says, what do you want me to do with him? And they shout, away with him, away with him. What does the word Azazel mean? To depart, to take away, to send away. So it's as if the crowd, the priests, are shouting for them, him to take away. And you go, why that language? Ah, well, it makes sense in the whole context of uh, the atonement. God is saying, here's one other aspect of the Christ, of my son. Not only is he the Passover lamb, not only is he the Tamid, the daily sacrifice, because he died at 3 p.m., but he's also the scapegoat. And when you need to repent, when you need to turn back to me at any point in time, through Jesus, as your sacrifice, as the ransom who died on your behalf, I will reconcile myself with you. So it's an amazing thing to see how the gospel writers are communicating this, if only we had eyes to see. So, okay, Jesus, no doubt, is that uh, scapegoat. Let's finish, because this is when it gets really good. Okay, we talked about the scarlet thread, right? 
if you Google Miracle of the Scarlet Thread, you'll find a whole bunch of websites that talk about this. And you can see on that picture of the goat there, the painting, the scarlet thread. Okay, so the priest, we have two goats standing in front of us. One is the goat that's going to provide atonement. That's the ransom that's going to go to God. The other one becomes the scapegoat. And of course, the priest identifies that with the scarlet thread. Now, I mentioned before, they take the goat with the scarlet thread. They would take him out into the wilderness east of Jerusalem to where all the cliffs are, kick him off a cliff, and they would take that scarlet thread, take it back to the temple, and they would hang it on the temple. And every year, what would happen, that scarlet thread would turn white. Like Isaiah 118, your sins are like scarlet, but they will become white as snow. And it told the people I ex that God accepts their sacrifice, the atonement, they're back in relationship. Okay? So this is what they did. Every year they brought that scarlet thread back to the temple. Then something happened, and the whole cosmos shifted. Okay? And what's so cool about this, and this is on your handout, this is found in Jewish writings. It's in Jewish uh, historical writings. It's an important comment because they're talking about something that happened within their history that concerns the Day of Atonement and something that happened at the temple. And so, if you, for anybody who would ever want to go look this up, it's the Babylonian Talmud, Yoma. So, notice Yom, like Yoma. Yom is day, 39b, that's where you would find it, okay? But let's read it. And this is, again, it's on your handout. During the 40 years prior to the destruction of the temple, now this is important because we've got a timeline. The 40 years prior to the destruction of the temple, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Okay? I know there's not supposed to be math in a Bible study, but you can do quick math. Forty years prior to the temple, what happened? Ah, a whole bunch of things happened. The lot for God did not arise in the priest's right hand at all. I'll talk about that in a minute. Now listen to this. So too, the strip of crimson wool that was tied to the head of the goat that was sent to Azazel did not turn white. God, so we have the crimson wool, that's that scarlet thread and it did not turn white. God was no longer accepting that as a sacrifice. And the scapegoat for their atonement for, the, for sins. Something shifted. Okay, now the last part is the westernmost lamp of the, candle, of the candle, candelabrum, can't say that, which is the menorah, did not burn continually. I'll explain that in a minute. Okay, so what happens 40 years prior to the destruction of the temple? Well, here's our math problem. It's 70 AD. We subtract 40, and what do we get? 30 AD. What happened about 30 AD? Jesus. And now there's a cosmic shift in, in where you get your atonement from. And it's recorded right here. So you go back to this 40 years prior to the destruction. The crimson wool stopped turning white because there was a new atoning sacrifice. That's what the book of Hebrews is talking about. It's really remarkable. That's no longer accepted. Now, the next part, uh, right at the beginning, right here, it says the, the lot that was cast did not end up in the priest's right hand. Now, it was considered bad luck if the lot for the Lord, the goat that was going to be for the Lord, if it ended up in your left hand more than two times, they considered it a bad omen and that God was not accepting the sacrifice. Well, this is saying for 40 years, God no longer ended up in the right hand. It would be a, that would be a terrible crisis of, of confidence. And then not only that, look down at the very last verse. The westernmost lamp of the candelabrum did not burn continually. So inside... Uh, the temple that's, that faced to the east, you had a menorah. The, 
the westernmost candle on the menorah is the is the candle that's closest to the the uh, holy of holies. And we talked a few weeks ago about Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, and how the the presence of God moved out of the temple and into his new spiritual house made of living stones. That's the church. And what marked that presence of God is flame or fire. So the fire of Pentecost is that presence of God taking up new residence in his house. And here we have a historical record that says the westernmost lamp, which is the one that was the eternal flame continuously burning, kept going out. And the flame represents the presence of God. The presence of God was no longer in that temple. It left. It had moved into its new house. And that's the church. And this is incredible that you actually have things in history that are lining up with Jesus as our scapegoat. Now, that's a lot of information, but I hope you can see so cool what's going on. Um, let's do quick review. First of all, atonement. What does that mean? We always have to investigate. How do we articulate better what these uh, religious words mean? Atonement. Well, it's about reconciliation. It's about a substitution, uh, a ransom that's a substitute so that we can come back into relationship with God. That's, the, that's what the atonement is uh, doing. Again, back into relationship because we were in relationship. And it gives the people, the ancient people, that concrete symbol of forgiveness. And sometimes I like it when I think, ah, God took my sins and threw them in the, in the, the bottom of the sea because I don't want to have to deal with them. That's a wonderful thing. Uh, we saw about the importance of knowing Jesus Barabbas versus Jesus the Christ and what Barabbas means because that helps us understand that scapegoat ceremony. And then the miracle, the, the scarlet thread, the part of the ceremony that they, the Jews had been doing suddenly stopped working around 30 AD. And great evidence, historical evidence, not written down by a Christian, that the death of Jesus had its uh, was efficacious and was accepted by God. And now it's an eternal sacrifice. So, okay, that's Day of Atonement, Jesus, the scapegoat, 